All right, starting up something different today. Actually, really excited about it. It's called The Sumerian Swindle How the Jews Betrayed Mankind, Volume 1 of three volumes. A book written by God, G underscore D. <clears throat> Second edition, 2014. The Bamboo Delight Company is the publisher. For a free reviewer's copy, download volumes 1, 2, and 3 at bamboo-delight.com slash item underscore 13 dot htm. And you can email them at books at bamboo-delight.com. Dedicated to his parents. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Deuteronomy 6, 10-11 The Goyim shall rebuild your walls, and their kings shall minister unto you. Your gates shall be opened continuously, day and night they shall not be shut, that men may bring to you the wealth of the Goyim, with their kings led in procession. For the Goyim, or kingdom that will not serve you, shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. Isaiah 60, 10 through 12 You shall suck the milk of the Goyim, you shall suck the breast of kings. Isaiah 60, 10 through 16 And Goyim shall stand and feed your flocks. Strangers shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. Men shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the Goyim, and in their riches you shall glory. Isaiah 61, 5 16. Um. I guess I'll go ahead and do both the introduction and chapter one here. They, they are pretty, very short actually. Um, book runs about 200, 263 pages. That's what it's saying here. <clears throat> uh, minus the footnotes and references, it probably probably be a little less than that. But these first couple of chapters can knock them out pretty quick. How the Jews Betrayed Mankind, Volume 1, The Sumerian Swindle, 5000 B.C. to 1500 B.C. Introduction In the beginning were the Jews. At least, this is how the Jews would write the history of mankind if they could get away with it. But in fact, in the beginning there were no Jews. The lies that they wrote about themselves in the Old Testament are just that, lies. Here is the real story of how the Jews betrayed mankind by making grandiose claims that give themselves value when no value is actually there those evil creatures known as rabbis will tell you that the jews are a unique people blessed above all other people by the mightiest god of their entire universe of the entire universe this god has sanctified them above all other people because they are so wonderful but this claim cannot stand even when casually inspected unique with their very own history aloof from all outsiders, concentrating their energies on the glorification of their God, untouched by the crassness of the goyim around them as they strive for holiness and perfection. These are some of the attributes that the rabbis would like you to believe about them, even though none of it is true. They would like you to believe that among men, the Jews are as rare and unique as a virgin mother. But are the Jews really unique, or do they only tell you that they are? After all, it costs nothing to brag about yourself. And if self-congratulation brings you prestige, wealth, and influence, all for the price of hot air and flapping lips, well, then, who has more hot air and flapping lips than a self-glorifying rabbi? Regardless of what the Jews say, when you inspect the actual merchandise, you will find that the sparkling Jews are only made of glass. This is why the Jews are so allergic to criticism, because their lies are so easily broken. 
By claiming that they are unique, the Jews can more easily avoid the obvious observation that they are exactly like any other secretive groups that have plagued mankind. They are not unique like shining saints, but rather they are unique like carnival barkers and con artists, <clears throat> con artists who claim to be more than they are, just so that they can deceive you and relieve you of your money. Part of the reason that the people of the world have difficulty in understanding what scoundrels the Jews are is because most people don't have the usual reference points for contrast. The Jews encourage this blindness by parroting their old lie that we Jews are a unique people unlike any other. The Jews pretend to be God's chosen saints while simultaneously committing all manner of crimes and atrocities against humanity. Ordinary people cannot discern the depths of the fraud simply because the distance between the actual facts of Jewish criminality and the self-glorified myth of Jewish holiness is so great. The distance between the reality and the lie is so great that it boggles the mind. Little crooks are understandable, but big crooks are difficult to fathom. Ordinary people, whom the Jews call goyim, which means non-Jew animals and insects, cannot imagine that entire families and an entire nation of betrayers and swindlers could possibly exist. Yes, single and small groups of robbers are understandable to the average person, but an entire nation of thieves and liars is too much for the ordinary person to comprehend. And so, because we cannot comprehend it, we do not believe that such an organized and predatory cult does exist. As a result, the Jews get away with their crimes and the people end up being swindled and betrayed, impoverished, defrauded, and murdered by hucksters wearing yarmulkes. So that you will have to open so that you will have open your eyes before entering into the actual history of the betrayers of mankind, I will first show you some similarities of the Jews to another criminal conspiracy that had plagued mankind undetected for many centuries. After all, to prove that the Jews are not as unique as they claim to be, it is necessary to first show their similarity to other people. So if the Jews are not unique, then to whom are they similar? It is important first to get these general background ideas firmly in mind as you study this history of the Jews, because we are dealing here with hundreds and thousands of years in time. And during this long time, entire families and clans and towns full of Jewish parents have been teaching their children for criminal skills have been teaching their children their criminal skills and passing the this conspiratorial lore and subterfuge along with countless generations of Jewish thieves and murderers. This is an historical fact that you must keep in mind as you read this book. Consecutive generations of crime families have existed, and they presently do exist, while they protect their secrets and transmit their schemes through many subsequent generations of fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. And so, to prove that the Jews are criminals and frauds and liars and deceivers and murderers, it is necessary to first show that they are not a unique variation in human history. In fact, they are very similar to the mafia crime families found in Italy and in America today, and especially similar to, similar to the thugs of old India. Perhaps I've pronounced that wrong. Spelled as if it, if it were thuggies of old India. T-H-U-G-G-E-E-S. Such historic crime organizations as the Italian Mafia and the thugs of old India have identical characteristics with the Jews of today, as you will soon see for yourself. And that concludes the introduction. Chapter 1. Mafia, Thugs, and Jews. For several hundred years in India, a similar people to the Jews used to, lived in, used to live in a family and clan villages. Used to live in family and clan villages. And they made their living as murderers and thieves. They called themselves thugs or thuggies. The thuggies of India were a secret society whose so-called religion was based upon murder and theft. They lived among their fellow Indians as rug weavers and artisans. To look at them, their fellow Indians could not tell that they were any different from themselves. They spoke the same language, wore the same clothes, and ate the same food. But the Thuggies worshipped the Hindu demon goddess Kali. It, it, it was the Thuggy belief that this demon goddess demanded that victims be sacrificed to her without shedding their blood. That is, the victims must first be strangled. 
for one month every year during the travel season in India when the weather was good and there were many travelers and pilgrims on the road, the thuggies would make some excuse to their employers and acquaintances to take a leave of absence from their regular occupations as merchants or weavers or restaurateurs or farmers, saying that they had to go to a distant wedding or to visit an ailing relative or using whatever excuse they could invent. They would leave their village and go to meet other thuggies for a month of murder and theft, all devoted to their goddess Kali, whom they believed would welcome them into the hereafter. Known among themselves as masters of deceit, the thuggies befriended rich travelers to whom they perfidiously offered their services as protectors and guides. But once they were in and out of the way location, but once they were in and out of the way location, they would fall upon the travelers and strangle them. This was the one and the only method of murder decreed by their demon goddess, to strangle their victims, never to knife or bludgeon them. As they tightened the garret around the neck of their victims, they whispered into their ears, See, O Kali, look, O Kali, calling their goddess to witness the crime. Then the thugs stole all of their victims' possessions, mangled their faces so that they could never be identified, and buried them deeply so that they could never be found. Their victims simply disappeared into the Mysteria of India, and when the travel season was over, the thuggies would return to their home villages with their newly acquired wealth and continue their lives as rug weavers and merchants, though richer than they had ever been before. The religious beliefs of the Thuggies was that they were the servants of their goddess, and just like the Jews, they served their deity by preying upon the people among whom they lived. And just like the Jews, their secret fraternity had their own secret language, secret meetings, and secret rituals. Indeed, because of the <clears throat> criminal nature of their practices, just like the Jews, they kept their actions hidden from outsiders, and just like the Jews, without practicing secrecy and deceit, they could not have perpetuated their wicked ways for so many centuries. Regardless, <coughs> excuse me, regardless of their alleged re religion of Kali worship, the thuggies knew that if they were caught in their crimes, that they would be punished. So, like all other criminal gangs, everything that they did was plagued with the fear of discovery and exposure. Everything that they did was masked with deceit and the utmost secrecy. In these ways, they were not at all different from the Jews. India is home to many diverse religions, and Hinduism is very tolerant of all of them. Even though the Indian people and Hinduism in general are accepting of all manner of religious activities and beliefs, no one in India would have accepted among themselves a secret group of murder murderers whose religious practice was to stealthily murder everyone whom they met and to steal their wealth. So, to practice their so-called religion without being executed for their crimes, secrecy and deceit were their most important tactics. When they murdered people who were traveling in large groups, they murdered everyone in the entire group and left no one alive as witness. Let wet my throat quit. As organized gangs, during the 300 years of known history of this thuggy cult, it has been estimated that the thuggies murdered between 1 million and 3 million people in India stole their belongings and buried their corpses. These millions of, peop of Indian people simply disappeared, never to be heard of again. Then the thuggies would return to their villages and lead lives of simple folks who often had extra money to help their fellow villagers and thus gain prestige for themselves, just like the Jews. Each and every year, the same routine was repeated as the secrets of the thuggies were passed down to sons and passed down to grandsons without the people of India ever having heard of this cult. Such was their secrecy. That the thuggies of India did not last for even longer than 300 years was strictly due to the preser was strictly due to the perseverance of the British in rooting them out. And the man who was primarily responsible for exterminating the thuggies from India in the early 1800s was Major General Sir William Henry Sleeman. Read a first-hand account of this great British hero's description of the thugs of India in the words of his biographer and great-grandson, Colonel James L. Sleeman, in Appendix 8. Er, Appendix A. Um, I can't click on it. I mean, this is a PDF. I'm not reading it off their website, but... I'll, I'll try and find out where that is in this book after I finish this chapter. 
and remembering that his description is of just one sweet-looking old Indian man. As you read his words, realize that we are not studying here another equally diabolical sect that is not at all unique, but rather is very similar to the thugs. Because these thuggies were in hereditary conspiracy, Major General Sleeman was able to extinguish these crime families by executing and imprisoning the fathers and imprisoning for life the sons. Thus, no thuggies were allowed to pass their evil teachings down to succeeding generations. And so, thuggy vanished from India, thanks to the British. Once you understand that crime families and their teachings are both hereditary and cultural, whether inherited from mafia families or thuggy families, you are ready to study the origins of the most secretive sect of murderous fanatics that have ever walked the earth. Like the thuggies, these also hide behind a mask of religion. In modern times, these evil monsters are known as Jews. That concludes chapter one, and I'm gonna see where I can find that appendix A. References, 262, 263. Okay. Um. Appendix A, The Thugs of Old India. So this is actually longer, about a few pages here, longer than both the introduction and the first chapter itself, but uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, read it. Let me wet my throat real quick. Appendix A, The Thugs of Old India. That the thugs of India did not last for even a longer, for an even longer time than 300 years was strictly due to the perseverance of the British in rooting them out. And the man who was primarily responsible for rooting the thuggies out of India in the early 1800s was Major General Sir William Henry Sleeman. Let's take a look at the thugs by reading the words of his biographer and great-grandson, Colonel James L. Sleeman, as he describes a sweet-looking old Indian man. But remember as you read his words that we are studying here another equally secretive and diabolical sect known as the Jews who are not at all unique, but are rather very similar to the thugs. Here we are reading what the Sleemans wrote about just one old man, just one old thug. So here it is. And if it were difficult to believe that the curtain was rising upon so hideous a drama, it would have been still harder to appreciate that this venerable native, with kindly face and white beard, had encompassed the death of a whole battalion of men, not by means of the ordinary weapons of assassination, but by the skillful use of the most harmless weapon in the world, the rumal, or strip of cloth, little bigger than a handkerchief. The use of this was not a question of choice, but of decree, for by the laws of the thugs' satanic faith, no blood should be shed during the process of murder. In fact, thuggy could not have existed for so long a time had its followers used knives or daggers. If the onlooker had hoped to find on the old thug's countenance some signs of remorse for a life spent almost entirely in treacherous murder, he would have been doomed to disappointment, for the old man positively beamed with pride and reminiscent delight, while the story of his ghastly past was drawn from him by skillful questioning, literally smacking his lips when recounting some particularly atrocious deed which had necessitated the exercise of great cunning and inhuman deceit. Do you never feel remorse for murdering in cold blood, and after the pretense of friendship, those whom you have beguiled into a false sense of security? asked Sleeman after one of these periods of obvious exultation. Certainly not, replied Baram. Baram? Baram? B-U-H-R-A-M. Are not you yourself a shikari, hunter of big game? And do you not enjoy the thrill of the stalk, the pitting of your cunning against that of an animal? And are you not pleased at seeing it dead at your feet? So with the thug who, indeed, regards the stalking of men as a higher form of sport. For you, Sahib, 
have but the instincts of the wild beasts to overcome, whereas the thug has to subdue the suspicions and fears of intelligent men and women, often heavily armed and guarded, and familiar with the knowledge that the roads are dangerous. In other words, game for our hunting is defended from all points, save those of flattery and cunning. Can you, cannot you imagine the pleasure of overcoming such protection during days of travel in their company? The joy in seeing suspicion change to friendship until that wonderful moment arrives when the rumal completes the shik shikur, shikur. This soft rumal sahib, here the old man exhibited a strip of coarse yellow and white cloth, the thug colors, has terminated the existence of hundreds. Remorse, sahib, never. Joy and elation, often. Such were the tales heard day after day during the suppression of Thuggy, varying little in detail, and always characterized by a total lack of feeling for the wretched victims. And Baram, however vile, was sincere in his belief that he had been engaged in work, not only pleasurable and profitable, but in addition, productive of great merit in the hereafter. Baram does not stand alone in his prowess as a thug, for several others ran him close in Thuggy history. Ramzam for example, with total of 604 murders, and Fuddy Khan, whose 508 victims in 21 years, as compared with Baram's 931 in 40 years, would have put him at the top of his profession had he not been captured. In an age when tales of crime prove so attractive and bookstalls groan beneath a wealth of imaginary horrors, these true tales of Thuggy must surely appear, appeal to those who prefer fact to fancy. And if the strange history of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is of interest, the actual dual personality of the thug must surely be more so. That fiend in human form, luring his victims to their doom with soft speech and cunning artifice, committing the cold-blooded murder of every man he met, saint or sinner, rich or poor, blind or lame, during his annual holiday and spending the remainder of the year as a public-spirited citizen of, seemingly, of seeming respectability. Thug, from the Sanskrit root stag, S-T-H-A-G, to conceal, is pronounced tug, and thuggy as tuggy. Okay, so tuggy, so I should have been saying it. To conceal, thug, to conceal. It is a term often wrongly applied, particularly in the United States, to bandits or hold-up men who do not attempt either concealment of their intention or strangulation. The thug was a murderer by hereditary profession, who sincerely believed that he had a divine right to kill, and no other class of criminal possesses the right to call itself by that name. Certainly not the modern type, for contemptible and horror Horrible as the thugs unquestionably were, it is certain that they would be loud in their expression of horror at the deeds of these despicable ruffians in western countries. However unscrupulous and treacherous the thugs were, one thing at least stands to their credit that while they sometimes killed women, though contrary to their faith, they never maltreated them beforehand. The taking of human life for the sheer lust of killing was the thugs' main object the plunder, however pleasant, being a secondary consideration. That robbery did not form the principal motive is clear from the fact that they made little effort to ascertain the wealth of those they put to death, and wretchedly poor men, their total worldly wealth less than six pence, constantly appear in thuggy records as having been added to the bag. The thug, indeed, regarded his profession much in the same light as the sportsman, no motive was required for the murders they planned to commit. Their, pers their prospective victims were unknown to them, and it mattered nothing whether they were Hindu or Mohammedan, for the thugs had in their ranks members of both religions. All travelers were fish for their net, and they watched their growing, growing toll of human life with exactly the same feeling of pride that the sportsman experiences when making his entries in a game book. Here was no body of amateur ass assassins, driven to crime by force of circumstance, but men of seeming respectability and high intelligence, often occupying positions of importance and responsibility in their normal lives, secretly trained from boyhood to the highest degree of skill in strangulation, 
Each thug had his particular job to do. To one fell the task of throwing the rumal around the victim's neck. To others, the task of seizing arms and legs and giving those scientific wrenches and cruel blows at vital parts which ensured his being bought, brought down at the psychological moment. These arts were continually practiced by the thug in his off-duty moments. Fathers teaching sons this foul work with parental pride until all engaged in a thug tuggy expedition became so expert that they could strangle their victims with the maximum of adroitness and in the minimum of, minimum of time. Their art was carried still further, for other thugs were especially trained to bury and conceal the murdered bodies with such skill that, their, that the ground beneath which they rested appeared undisturbed. In the heyday of the organization, these experts could bury the body within half an hour, with such success that even the thugs themselves could only find the graves later by reference to landmarks. The histrionic sense of the thug was highly developed, many being remarkably good actors, and if they detected the slightest suspicion on the part of travelers, they were attempting to ingratiate themselves with, they immediately departed and disappeared in another direction. No sooner were they out of sight, however, than messengers were sent to other gangs, for they quartered the ground like wolves, who caught up with the travelers, primed with any information that the first thugs had gleaned, and it was seldom that the quarry escaped death. A rich merchant, for example, protected by an armed escort, would meet on his journey some seemingly poor men, who would ask permission to avail themselves of his protection. Being unarmed and few in number, this request would be granted and the party would proceed together for some days. The thugs, for such they were, losing no opportunity of making themselves pleasant and useful, until the combined party journeyed together with a confidence born of friendship. Meanwhile, other thugs, apparent strangers, but actually of the same gang, would day by day be overtaken and allowed to join the party, this process being repeated until at least the genuine travelers were outnumbered. Then the opportunity would come when two or more thugs stood unobtrusively behind each traveler, waiting for the signal to kill. This was usually tabak la o, bring tobacco, whereupon the rumals were instantly thrown round the necks of the victims who were strangled so skillfully that they could neither escape nor fight for their lives. The bodies were cut. The bodies were then cut, but to prevent swelling upon decomposition, which would raise the surface of the graves and so attract attention, and carefully buried at beels or bellies, B-E-L-E-S, permanent murder places, is what, that was what it means, and carefully buried at, selected beforehand, at beels, permanent murder places. These murders were planned with such forethought and accurate calculation that often these graves were prepared many days ahead. If there were people in the vicinity and it was dangerous to dig the graves in the open, the thugs did not scruple to bury the bodies beneath their own tents, eating their food and sleeping on the soil without a qualm. Many devices were adopted by the thugs to make their murders easier, one favorite ruse being to feign sickness. The thug selected for the part pretending to be taken violently ill. Others would attempt to succor him, but to no purpose, the pains growing increasingly severe. It was then pretended that a charm would restore him, and the doomed travelers were induced to sit around a pot of water, to uncover their necks, and to look up and count the number of stars. Having, in their superstitious folly, put themselves over so completely in the hands of the thugs, the rumals were about were about their necks in a trice, and they were strangled with dispatch. Goodness gracious. The thugs' repertoire of such tricks was extensive, and he rang the changes according to the type of victim he was after. The rumal with which the murders were committed was some thirty inches in length, with a knot formed at the double extremity and a slip knot eighteen inches from it, giving the thug a firm, hit, a firm hold. After the victim had been brought to the ground, the slip knot was loosened, and the thug then made another fold around the neck, put his foot against it, and drew the cloth tight. To quote the words of a thug, 
just as if packing a bundle of straw. A gang of thugs usually numbered from 20 to 50 men, but was sometimes much larger. On one occasion, a gang of 360 accomplished the murder of 40 persons. As a general rule, they pretended to be merchants or soldiers traveling without weapons in order to disarm suspicion, which gave them an excellent excuse for seeking permission to accompany travelers, for there was nothing to excite alarm in their appearance. Most thugs were mild-looking and per peculiarly courteous, for this camouflage formed part of their stock in trade, and well-armed travelers felt no fear in allowing these knights of the road to join them. This first step successfully accomplished, the thugs gradually won the confidence of their intended victims by a demeanor of humility and gratitude, and feigned interest in their affairs until familiar with details of their homes, whether they were likely to be missed if murdered, and if they, were, and if they knew anyone in the vicinity. Sometimes they traveled long distances together before a suitable opportunity for treachery occurred. A case is on record where a gang journeyed with a family of 11 persons for 20 days, covering 200 miles, before they succeeded in murdering the whole party without detection. Another gang accompanied 60 men, women, and children, 160 miles before they found a suitable occasion to put them all to death. The favorite time for murder was in the evening when the travelers would be seated in the open, the thugs mingling with their victims and all talking, smoking, and singing happily together. But the thugs' motto was, there's no fun like work, and three of them would sit close to each prospective victim. On the signal being given, two would lay hold of his hands and feet, while the third manipulated the rumal, not relaxing his grip until life was extinct. Many thugs were influential citizens in ordinary life amassing wealth from their murders with which to bribe those who might otherwise have given them away. Money counts in crime even today, west or east, and the thugs enjoyed the countenance, protection, and support of many ruling chiefs and powerful landowners in return for choice booty and renting land at extortionate rates. These influential Indians shared in the unlawful fruits of thuggy expeditions without the slightest feeling of religious or moral responsibility for murders, which they knew were perpetuated to secure them, and were content with the promise that the thugs would not commit murder within their states and thereby involve them in trouble. Often the native police and villagers were also conciliated by bribes, as was shown on one occasion when thugs bungled the killing of 25 travelers and were pursued to the village of Tigura, where the inhabitants came to their support and protected them against arrest. Indeed, during the operations for the suppression of Thuggy, it was found that some subordinate native police were actually practicing thugs, and that this was frequently the case with the Chakidars, Chakidars, C-H-A-U-K-I-D-A-R-S, or Night Watchmen, of villages and houses. With such consummate scoundrels, such formidable protection, and such opportunities, small wonder that Thuggy flourished for centuries and accounted for many thousands of innocent lives during its long reign. Horrible as all of this reads, it must be borne in mind that the Thugs considered their murders precisely in the light of sacrifices to their goddess. Not only did they plan and meditate over their murders without misgivings, but they, perpetu but they perpetrated them without any emotion of pity. Their horrid treachery and cruel strangulations troubled neither their dreams and recollections, nor caused them the slightest disturbance even in the hour of death. They considered, in fact, that their victims were killed by God, with them as her agents, their appointed job being to kill travelers. To quote the words of a thug, just as a tiger feeds upon deer. In wading through the tragic and unsavory records of Thuggy, nothing strikes one more than the contrast between their devilry when engaged in their wicked hunting and their trustworthiness in, dis in decent employment and real affection for their wives and children, which stand out saliently in pages of history blotted with hideous crime. To illustrate this double life, a case is on record where an Englishman, Dr. Check, had a bearer in charge of his children. The man was a special favorite, remarkable for his kind and tender ways with his little charges, gentle in manner and exceptional in all his conduct. Every year he obtained leave of absence for the, fi for the filial, filial purpose, as he said, of visiting his aged mother for a month, returning punctually at the end of that time and resuming the care of his little darlings with his customary affection and tenderness. 
This mild and exemplary being was later discovered by Sleeman to be a thug, kind, gentle, conscientious, and regular at his post for eleven months of the year, devoting the twelfth to strangulation. Cold-blooded human beasts with a callous disregard for the sanctity of human life for one-twelfth of the year and patterns of virtue for the remainder. Just as locusts pass across a pleasant landscape leaving nothing but stripped trees and desolation behind, so the thugs on their expeditions left a trail of death and misery. No feelings of shame, horror, or remorse ever caused a thug to lose a moment's sleep. A minute's sleep, I should say. On the contrary, just as sportsmen sit over the fire at night and talk with pleasure of the day's bag, so the thug, when resting from his revolting labors, discussed his murders with equal pleasure, rejoicing over particular acts of treachery which had lured unhappy men and women to their doom. The thugs, indeed, were so inconspicuous owing to the care that with which they divided their gangs and the cunning way they played their different parts, that they were rarely suspected of murder, and even if suspicion did fall upon them, by that time those concerned had long since scattered and returned to their respectable employments, and were once again posing as public-spirited citizens and model parents. Thus the difficulty of suppressing an age-old secret organization of murder, itself existing in a country renowned for secrecy and mystery, will be appreciated. For Tuggy was a mysterious religion of murder, protected not only by a secret language, but also by native chiefs, officials, landholders, and other important people who, while themselves ignorant of its secrets, knew enough to be convinced that its support, that to support its count continuance and protect its followers was to their own pecuniary advantage. Thuggy was a hereditary profession the sons of thugs being taught their craft by skilled leaders who led them by easy stages to the point of murder, so that they came to look on thuggy not only as a legitimate reason of profit but also as a pleasant pastime. On reaching manhood, therefore, they were not only versed in all the arts and crafts essential to unveiling their victims, but the treacherous murders they had, com they had seen committed by their seniors, whom they respected, had produced a callousness of mind which made them for all time devoid of feelings of pity and remorse for their victims. The absence of motive for their murders, the fact that they never murdered near their own homes, the splitting up of the gangs and the return to respectability after a comparatively short period of absence, their secret language and signs, the support and patronage they obtained from those who benefited by the murders they committed who asked no questions, providing their palms were well oiled, their respectable appearance and pleasing manners, the, rep the reputable, reputable, if fictitious reasons given for their absence, had all combined to keep Thuggy secret for centuries. With members of almost every profession and trade in their ranks, the thugs found no difficulty in selecting for the duty of unveiling those best suited to excite the confidence or dull the fears of any kind of traveler. It was, indeed, the very terror of finding themselves alone on dangerous roads which induced travelers to join what appeared to be parties of respectable men, whose principal concern seemed to be the protection of those exposed to such risks. If one thing stands out more clearly than any other, in these gruesome records of Thuggy, it is that, just as, a cat, just as a cat plays with a mouse before killing it, so the thugs unquestionably extracted considerable satisfaction in, in ingratiating themselves with their prospective victims, spending days in changing suspicion to confidence before murdering them. Often and long did Pharyngia and other captured thugs laugh over tales of the innocence and faith of their victims, which they had so cruelly shattered, and as one wades through these dry official records, one cannot fail to see in imagination these poor hapless travelers rejoicing at being in safe hands while surrounded by thugs licking their lips in anticipatory pleasure. Sleeman was fortunate in two main things. First, in the capture of approvers, thugs who turned in their comrades in exchange for life in prison rather than hanging. These approvers supplied excellent information, and second, he discovered the secret language of Thuggy, that spinal cord of its nervous system. The day that Sleeman dragged this into the light hammered the first big nail in the coffin of Thuggy, for until then, thugs, whether free or under arrest, could converse before their victims of, or gaolers with impunity. 
Next he prepared family trees of the thugs, work entailing laborious research, painstaking care and minute accuracy, a masterpiece of genealogical record, which ensured that every thug by hereditary descent was ultimately accounted for. Fortunately for India, the meshes of Suleiman's Saiv sieve of justice were microscopically small, for it was of the utmost importance to ensure that no thug, innocent or guilty, should, should again go free. Hard as this may sound, it was essential, for being a hereditary religion of murder, the phoenix would have risen from the ashes and thuggy grown again with alarming rapidity. Those convicted of murder and not required as approvers were hanged. Those who proved to be thugs but not actually found guilty of murder were imprisoned for life. The sons of thugs, either by birth or adoption, who were too young to have started in on a career of murder, were imprisoned in comparative comfort, though forced into celibacy, and employed in tent or carpet making or other industries, in order that there should not be a native in India living in freedom who could claim to be a descend who could claim to be descended from a thug. And so this abominable confraternity, which had for centuries infested the roads of India and made away with over a million of victims, was destroyed. And that'll do it for this recording. Thanks for listening.